Hey, this is Kotlin Conversations, where we're having conversations with just a few of the many wonderful guests and speakers here at Kotlin Conf 2024. I'm Quinn Tuet Dow, and I have the pleasure of speaking with... Simon. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good. Well, I, I think you're doing even better because you finished your talk. Yes. We came back from a fire alarm. We're back. We're online, and we're here talking. Uh, Simon, just for the folks uh, watching, where what, are, what do you do, and how did you, what, like how did you get started with Kotlin? So I started out as a Java Android engineer, and then around 2015, when Kotlin started to be talking about first by Jake Horton, I thought it was interesting, and I started picking it up. And I had a very small project that allowed me to start with Kotlin from scratch. And I had oh, a wow. great experience. Lucky. <laughs> and then I started introducing more companies. And you know, since 2015, I've been using Kotlin exclusively in production. Uh, I think from 2015 to like 18, 19, I was doing Android. And then I've also done a lot of backend, mm -hmm. object-oriented programming, functional programming, but now mostly a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's mostly what I've been doing. Uh, yeah, and well, I mean, the reason that I, I kind of noted your name specifically is that you're currently is uh, you're a maintainer of Arrow, yes. which I, I and as an Android dev, I'm also an Android dev. Uh, unsurprising, there's many of us about in the Kotlin space. Um, I know that Arrow is probably like the one of the places that I kind of understood as a very functional programming oriented library. And I think Kotlin for me was my first exposure to functional programming. Uh, so your talk is basically about Arrow 2.0 and, and kind of the current state of it. Can you just give us a little, without spoiling your talk, because we won't be able to see Simon's talk, um, can you just give us some, like kind of a general idea of like where is Arrow now? And like maybe even let people know, like if they haven't heard of Arrow, like what is the purpose of it and what does it give on top of Kotlin? Right. So. Colin already gives us a lot of tools, right? Really nice type zip code, like nullable types and sealed classes really help us improve our code. But sometimes we need more. And while we originally started from what is classic functional programming, right. which didn't really work very nice, we eventually turned into a DSL based library. So almost everything in the library is a DSL. Oh, beautiful. Uh, so it also works really nice with the upcoming context parameters and everything feels really natural and all the complexity of functional programming has disappeared. So I actually don't really attach it to functional programming anymore. Really? Okay. I think it's a tool set for making your code more type safe. Right? Everything is plug and play so you can choose what you want when you want it uh, and you don't have to opt into everything. Right? So, so I, I can, oh, okay, great. So I don't have to know exactly what a monad is to use it. No, I'm just kidding. No, I know that's an I, easy joke. I have not used that word in over five years, no, I think. <laughs> I, I love that because I think that's one thing is like, I, I really love the idea of functional programming. And I, I think, you know, I come from a very object oriented background, just kind of like where I, when, when I started learning and started programming. So I think functional programming is so interesting to me is that it's very opposite from how I learned, you know, software engineering. And so when I think Arrow first came out, you know, like we, you know, I feel like Arrow and Kotlin has been in my brain since like the start, since like 2017 when we first got, you know, Kotlin first party support on Android. I still didn't get it, and Arrow felt like this. Oh, this is something for functional programming experts and enthusiasts. But it sounds like more. It's not. I, I don't have to feel like I can't. Like I, I'm not able to access it now. It feels a little more. Broad well, or like a so general? the project is 11 years old now. So the first commit was in 2013, I think on Kotlin 038. Uh, so it's extremely old. Yeah. And it came from a group of Scala developers that were using Spring and that didn't feel right. And they moved to Kotlin mm -hmm. to opt into the Spring support. And they were missing some stuff from Scala. And that's what they initially you know, brought to Kotlin. And then while it evolved more and more, we've we felt that it didn't really felt right in the language anymore. But we were very early in time. So we had a concurrency type before there was Colin X core team. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden we were in conflict, right? In 2018, when Colin concurrency was announced, mm -hmm. we were in conflict because we had like a competing type and that's not what we wanted. So whenever something in the language or something first party comes that is in conflict or implements the same use cases that we have, we are more than happy to remove our code, remove mm -hmm. the maintenance, because we want first party support, we want calling idiomatic code, and that's also what we did. So we replaced all our naming based on the naming in the standard library, we adapted our techniques to the techniques we see in the standard library, and that allowed us in the last six years to evolve to something that's much more calling idiomatic and should feel natural for everyone in Kotlin. 
That's wonder. well, that's wonderful. I mean, like, it's funny because I know you're talking about Era 2.0, and of course we just heard that Kotlin 2.0 was released. So, I mean, I don't know if that was intentional, but it, it does sound like you're trying to, like, it, it's like a, you're working with and kind of dancing with right. Kotlin as a language, which I, exactly, I love. Yeah. yeah. So we have three, I would say, big modules. One accompanies, let's say, the standard library. Mm -hmm. Then there's a, another module or group of modules that add stuff to Kotlin Xcoroutines. And then we have a special module that I hope becomes a language feature. There's a key for it, yeah. um, which is working with immutable data. Uh, but it's, it kind of complements language, right? Because it works over sealed classes, data classes, collections. Mm -hmm. So um, if you could just pick one thing that is your favorite feature that, you know, so, so for me, I haven't used Arrow yet, Arrow yet, I'm so sorry. And I, I'm actually really interested now hearing, listening, talking to you about it. What, what would be like a feature that you'd be like, when you should use this, this will make you really appreciate Arrow and want to use it again? What's your favorite? So, I think everybody works with immutable data, and yeah, especially yeah. a lot of people in Compose work with immutable data. Yeah. And I think we should be free in how we structure that data, right? And currently, when we work with immutable data, it often requires a lot of code to update values. Yes. Um, so we typically tend to keep our hierarchy shallow. Yes. Because yeah. of this reason. So mm -hmm. it feels like a blocker in the language. So that you should be more freely mm -hmm. to model it however you want without resulting in complex transformations. And the Arrow Optics library offers a DSL for working with sealed classes, data classes, collections. So it's much more powerful than just a copy method. And I think it can simplify a lot of people's code. We have a Compose integration that allows you to work over shared state, few models, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Right, so you can very elegantly work with very deep new lists and complex data structures in a very elegant way that suits your use case in your domain. I, I love that because especially with Compose, as you mentioned, I think for, especially for Android people, you know, Compose and even taking functional programming out of it for a second, that we're finding that we have to think about state and how we manage right. state very differently and to work with Compose. So I actually love that. Okay, I'm gonna try it today when I get home. So thank you so much. I, I did wanna go back though, because it's funny, because we were talk, chatting a little bit before actually chatting, and Simon said that he actually is very interested in concurrency. And I have to admit that while, I won't say I hate concurrency, but I, I do feel like, like a lot of developers, concurrency is just something that I've always found difficult. It's, it's got a huge curve. I was confessing to Simon that when I was in uni, there was one class where I did very well on every project except for one, and it had to do with Java threading, and I, I was so sad because it, I just did not get it. What, what, what is it about concurrency? Like, why, why did you tell me that concurrency is one of your favorite topics? Uh, what is it about it that... Well, it's, it started in a very strange way. So before Colleague Score Teams was announced, we needed we wanted a more structured way of dealing with concurrence, right? As an yeah. end user, right? Yeah, yeah. We want structure and we want to assume that things work, like the structure concurrence in DSL. Yeah. Uh, so we built, I built something for that. Uh, and that was very hard. I made a lot of mistakes. I had to write thousands of tests to make sure that everything is working. And even writing tests for concurrent things is also extremely difficult, right? Yeah. So, and you know, that was a long process. So by now it's been like seven years that I've been working in this thing. And before that I was using Eric's job and I was also extremely interested in the internals. Mm -hmm. So for some reason when I start work using something, I don't know how it works, I want to dig in. Yeah, right? absolutely. So I've dug into a lot of stuff. I've dug into the Compose compiler, into Eric's Java, Colonix core things. I've got my own concurrency framework. I've studied things in Scala. Mm -hmm. I've that is a lot of different things. And what I also find interesting, that if you go to the guts, if you go to the low level stuff, it's yeah. always the same. Really? And so there's yeah. all these abstractions, but yeah. in the end, we're all doing the same, right? That, no, that's fair, yeah. We're running things on an executor service or running things in threads. That's the only thing you can really do in Java, right? So mm -hmm. we just add some stuff on top to make it look nicer. No, fair, yeah. Um, what is it? So I, I guess I, you know, so, so you've kind of followed along, right? So, you know, as you mentioned before, like way back in the, we had just Java threads and executors, and then of course Arcs, Java, and other kind of like, you know, um, stream, the kind of like streaming libraries kind of try to change the way that we did concurrency or the way that we approach concurrency. And of course now we have, you know, coroutines. How do you feel about the state of concurrency now? Because again, it, it is one of those things that I feel like, it, I, I just have a really hard time a lot of times understanding what my concurrency code does. Like I feel like I have to like, meditate, open my brain up, <laughs> and, and kind of get into a state where I can understand it. How do you feel 
about the current state of concurrency in, you know, let's say the mobile Kotlin space? Like, well, I think the Kotlin Scrutin's library is really marvelous. You know, it's yeah. really ingenious, and the structured concurrency DSL works really well. Of course, there's always some trade-offs, mm -hmm. especially cancellation is something extremely tricky. Yeah. Uh, but I think they've done an amazing job. And I think Kotlin does this all the time. It perfectly seems to sit between object-oriented programming and functional programming. So mm -hmm. if, from my perspective as a functional program, or if I put my functional programming hat on <laughs> and I look in the internals of Kotlin, I can see all the techniques that we find in Haskell and Scala. Mm -hmm. But they have turned it into such an elegant DSL that mm -hmm. you can never tell this is actually how this thing works. Yeah. But we are doing exactly the same thing that we put in functional languages are doing. It's similar for the Kotlin X flow data type. That's yeah. why it's so fundamentally different from Eric's Java. Mm -hmm. What do you, if someone, so if someone is just having struggles or maybe just approaching, you know, concurrency programming for the first time, what would you, what tips or advice would you give them to kind of, I don't know, understand it better or put themselves in a good place where they're not getting a bug report somewhere down the line where something has misaligned or interleaved with something that they didn't expect? Like what, what would be your like top advice to someone learning concurrency? Ooh, it's a tricky question. So I've learned very well and I think I'm, a bit unique in this, I learn best from reading other people's code, right? That's yeah, why yeah. I read the internals from Eric's Java and Colonic Score teams. Mm -hmm. But I think that's not a good general advice. Mm -hmm. um, what I think for, works really well is work in isolation and write a lot of tests, right? Mm -hmm. So think about what you think the program, the concurrent program will do and try to make it as extreme as possible and try to verify and test if that is actually what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you will learn a ton from that. Right. So you should really experiment with these things in isolation because the problem is to if you do this in a large Android application, yeah. where is the issue coming from? No, what yeah. cost issue? Yeah. Was it some mutable state somewhere? Did we forget something somewhere? And it's really hard to figure out. So it's if you really want to learn about concurrency, I would mm -hmm. focus on the outside of an application. That's that's a good point. Just kind of go to basics, right. understand it. Do is there a mistake or just a problem that you see happen? over and over again with concurrency that you might warn people off of? Or? Well, I think the biggest gotcha in Colin is the cancellation exception, right? That is very uh, fair, yeah. But, you know, there's some interesting discussions happening on Utrecht to see if they can improve that, you know, because it's a, it's a contract in the language, right, that we yeah. cannot swallow it or mm -hmm. resolve it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the issues, but that's not something Colin can solve, is that it's an Ill illegal state exception. And we regularly capture legal state exceptions. Yeah. Uh, so if you accidentally swallow a cancellation exception that way, that can really mess up mm -hmm. uh, your program because the outside callers will not know that this happened since you swallowed the cancellation right, right, signal. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, but I can also say that you know, other alternatives are also not perfect, right? So cancellation is extremely tricky. Mm -hmm. um, and if you run into a cancellation bug, it's typically super annoying to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a silent bug and there's no report and you need to try to figure out what happened wrong. Okay, so keep an eye out for it. But as you said, like it, it seems like um, kind of a theme in a lot of things that we talked about is like there's always a compromise, there's always a balance and that maybe like focusing on the fact that I don't like this particular thing, I don't like this particular construct is not the point, but that we have the best, we, we kind of have a good middle solution and is trying yes. to figure out your specific problem. I like that very much. Um, I, I, do, I do like the idea that functional programming is not the best, object-oriented important programming is not the best, and so, and so on. If, even though I might have a problem with cancellation exception, there are probably worse options out there. So yes, for sure. Good lessons to learn. Um, Simon, I had such a great time talking to you. Um, please definitely check out Simon's talk. Uh, on Arrow 2.0 uh, when it goes up on the Kotlin Conf channel. Uh, Simon, if people wanted to find you and follow you and ask you for more advice <laughs> about concurrency and other things, where can they find you on the internet? So I'm most act active on the Kotlin Slack. So okay, you can perfect. find me there daily. I'm also active on Twitter and LinkedIn. So you can also find me there if you want to follow me on social media. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Simon. I hope you have a brilliant uh, rest of Kotlin Conf. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure being here. Oh, it was a pleasure having you and a pleasure having y'all watch us. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Simon.